You're listening to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, episode 023. These are the average thresholds. You must look at the individual patient. You must see how they're doing. You must see how they're feeling. You must be doctors. And then use that information to refine how you choose to use blood. And that what we're providing are, yes, they're hemoglobin thresholds, but, but you should not use them in isolation. They have to be applied to the patient. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Blood Bank Guy Essentials, episode 23. I'm very excited that you've taken the time to download this podcast and listen to my interview with Dr. Jeff Carson from the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and Rutgers University. We'll get to that in just a second, but I want to mention to you that I'm recording this on December 2nd, 2016, and uh, we're very near the end of the year, obviously. We just have this podcast and one more episode before the end of the year. And really, I just feel lucky. I feel so grateful to all of you who have listened. Um, And I also feel very, very grateful to the great guests that I've had this year. Um, An enormous number of of really super qualified people. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention last week's podcast with uh, uh, Professor Nancy Heddle uh, from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And she, Nancy is the lead author of the INFORM trial kind of put to bed or nearly put to bed the age of blood issue. If you haven't listened to episode 22, please go back and check it out. And speaking of landmark studies, Dr. Carson is the lead author of an article that came out online in October of 2016 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. That article is called Clinical Practice Guidelines from the AABB, Red Blood Cell Transfusion Thresholds and Storage. It's a landmark article for sure, and it it updates the guidelines that that were published from ABB and Dr. Carson in 2012 um, and gives additional information on the appropriate threshold for transfusing someone red blood cells. Now, before we get to that, uh, Dr. Carson wanted me to let you know that during the guidelines development, he was pending a grant application for a study that became known as the MINT trial, and that now he actually has a grant from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute funding that trial, the MINT trial. He'll discuss that a little bit during the podcast. So I've kept you waiting long enough. I give you now my interview with Dr. Jeff Carson. All right, everyone, it is my great honor today to welcome Dr. Jeff Carson to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. Jeff, welcome. Hi, Joe. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, I really, really appreciate you being here. And I'd like to tell everyone a little bit about you before we get started. There's a lot to tell, so I'm going to kind of contract it a little bit. Dr. Jeff Carson is the provost for the New Brunswick campus of Rutgers Biomedical Health Science, has been in that role since 2014. He's been a member, though, of the Robert Wood Johnson Medical Faculty since 1987. His current role is as the Richard C. Reynolds MD Chair in General Internal Medicine, and he also serves as the Department of Medicine's Vice Chair for Research. He is trained in internal medicine, as you may have guessed from what you just heard, uh, though he also has research training in clinical epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania um, and also spent a year um, at the University of Oxford in London doing extensive training in clinical trials. Dr. Carson practices both office and hospital-based internal medicine um, and has been awarded five different teaching awards, and he's been on the annual Best Doctor list since 1998. Um, He has extensive experience in clinical trials. He's served on the Clinical Trials Review Committee at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institutes and actually serves as the chair of that committee. Um, and his the focus of his research is primarily in determining the risk of anemia and indications for transfusion. His work has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, Annals of Internal Medicine, just to name a few, including the article that we're going to talk about today. Um, so Jeff, I, before we, before we get rolling on the article, I, I really, I'm curious, um, as I said, most of the people that I talk to on this podcast are, are more laboratory based and obviously you're a clinician. That's awesome. What was it that got you interested in, in working on transfusion guidelines and, and working in, uh, on the things that you're doing in terms of, in terms of how to transfuse people well? Well, Joe, thank, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, So early in my career, I was working at a hospital in which there was a surgeon, uh, his name was Richard Spence, who was doing a trial on on Fluosol, which was one of the very early 
um, oxygen carriers. Sure. And he was attracting a large number of, of patients of the Jehovah Witness faith mm-hmm. uh, to our hospital. And I was his internal medicine consultant. Okay. I used to see his patients and <laughs> help them try to keep them alive and, uh, and, and, and doing well while they're in the hospital. Nice. And uh, this got me interested in the whole question of what was the association between anemia, hemoglobin levels, and outcomes. Mm-hmm. And, and everything has followed since then. So it's, it's a classic example of, of getting a, a research idea mm-hmm. from your clinical experience and then well, big time running with it, to say the least. I mean, I, I've been running with it for many years now, and <laughs> it's it's been a it's been a passion of mine. And and it's and I've been stepping through the various uh, questions that arise. So yes. we, st- my very first NIH grant was, uh, we we were able to uh, find two thousand patients who had undergone surgery in the operating room, uh, who were of the Jehovah Witness faith, and mm-hmm. and. You know, this was very early. Remember, this is way back in the early 90s before bloodless medicine programs were at every hospital in the country. Sure. Uh, these, these were just in a few locations. And, you know, we had to fi- find a few people who would help us do this. And we've got all these medical records and abstracted them and were able to evaluate the association between pre and post operative hemoglobin levels and mortality and morbidity. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that study was published in The Lancet uh, way back in, ooh, 86 or 90. I don't remember anyway. Nice. It's a while ago. And, uh-huh. uh, um, and that study showed two things. is The lower your hemoglobin goes, the higher your odds of death. Right. And the second thing it showed was in patients with underlying cardiovascular disease, their odds of death was much greater than patients without cardiovascular disease uh, when you looked at the various hemoglobin levels, that is, if someone had a hemoglobin level uh, of seven, that mm-hmm. they were much more likely to die if they had underlying cardiovascular disease than if they did not have underlying cardiovascular Got disease. It. And that was that was the big finding in that study, and uh, and I think the reason the Lancet chose to publish it. And mm-hmm. um, so that started me on the the next step of questions was, okay, you've identified the level of hemoglobin where bad things start to happen, you know, mm-hmm. and, and so the next question is, does transfusion modify that risk? And, and so you can't just assume that because <laughs> people die, that if you get blood, that that's going to be the difference. Because when people get severely anemic, they're sick. There are reasons right. why they get down low. Mm-hmm. Um, they're bleeding. They have serious underlying illnesses. And, it's, and one should not presume that blood would modify that risk. Mm-hmm. And so what led the, the first study that followed that was what we, you know, in those days were called outcome studies. Mm-hmm. They're now called comparative effectiveness. They have all these, these names, but basically it's an observational study in which we look at people who got blood versus people who did not get blood. And we did this in 10,000 hip fracture patients. And, uh, um, and, and that paper uh, was published in JAMA and showed that we could not show any... Uh, either positive or negative effects of transfusion in the range of hemoglobins between eight and 10, mm-hmm. in which um, uh, the, the majority of the data was, uh, 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 the, the, the majority of the uh, hemoglobin levels that were used to transfuse patients uh, in, 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 that, in, in that observational study. Now, what I have said a lot in recent years is you can't trust observational data in this field. <laughs> Right. And, 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 and uh, um, our study is actually one of the few studies that didn't show an effect. Almost all the data in the field, when it's, where you look at people who get blood versus people who don't get blood, what you find is that almost all those studies show that blood is killing patients. Okay? Hmm. Blood is leading to more infections. Right. And, I, and there's not any doubt in my mind, and this is the point that I write about all the time, is that patients who get blood transfusion are different than patients who don't. They're mm-hmm. sicker, mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And no matter how hard you try to control for those differences using statistical techniques, um, it doesn't work. Right. And it doesn't work because you can't measure all the, the, uh, the, the key variables. Mm-hmm. And the key variable winds up being, you know, you can say that, you know, patients have heart disease or they have lung disease or they have diabetes. Mm-hmm. 
But what you can't say and what is not recorded in the medical record and is not analyzed in almost any of these observational studies is you can't say one patient is sicker than the other. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and guess what? Sicker patients are more likely to get transfused <laughs> and sicker patients are likely to die. Right. Okay. And so, you know, we call this in the, in the uh, clinical epidemiology world, we call that confounding by indication mm -hmm. and you can't fix that problem. Yep. And so that led to uh, my pursuit of clinical trials. And, and, um, and so, as you mentioned, I, I, I did a sabbatical year at Oxford, uh, something I would strongly advise any of you to consider doing. <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And um, I learned that was my first introduction to clinical trial methodology and, uh, and evidence-based medicine. And, um, and basically, I came back with the tools uh, necessary to eventually do what we call the focus trial, which yes. was, you know, our NIH funded uh, 2000 patient trial that mm -hmm. was uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine. So that's kind of the history of how I, you know, how I got to, to this point. So I have been doing trials and then systematic reviews of literature mm -hmm. and then guidelines all surrounding. These are all techniques that are used to, um, to, 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 to provide information to clinicians mm -hmm. uh, to guide transfusion decisions. That's, so it's different ways of, of addressing the same kinds of questions. You bet. Well, and with, with that background, actually, that, that I think gives us a much better picture on how you came to be in the position that you are now uh, with regards to, uh, to, to being the lead author on these, the, the, these articles about guidelines for red cell transfusions. Uh, so the article, everyone that we're talking about today, uh, I'm sure that most of you are well familiar with, with it, but we're, we're going we're gonna to dive into it a little bit. Um, Jeff, um, I, I believe it was published uh, online in in October, uh, JAMA published an article that I, I know obviously was very important to you and the rest of us in the transfusion committee uh, community, I should say. The article was entitled Clinical Practice Guidelines from the AABB Red Cell Transfusion Thresholds and Storage. And obviously, as I mentioned, you were the lead author of that, as well as the lead author <clears throat> excuse me, on a, on a similar set of guidelines from 2012 published in Annals of Internal Medicine. So why don't you, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give you back the floor. Tell us a little bit about what, well, let me, let me back up for a second. Obviously there were guidelines that you had published in 2012. What, why did we need to update them? What, what's, uh, what was the driving force to, to reissue these guidelines in 2016? So that was uh, a question the AABB asked us as well. <laughs> you know, why should they? Why should they support um, and assist us in, in redoing the guidelines? And the, the answer is that back in 2012, we had, you know, about uh, 15 or so trials. Um, most of them were small, not very well done. Mm -hmm. um, the focus trial, which at the time was and still is the was the largest trial, had just come out which included 2,000 patients. And we had about 6,000 patients who had been enrolled in clinical trials. And we were at the stage where we could begin to look at clinical outcomes uh, in, in, in those trials and mm -hmm. compare them and combine them. But we really didn't have a whole lot. That's actually not a lot of data mm -hmm. to start looking at other clinical events like heart attacks and infections and so forth. Sure. So. Um, since that time, there had been a whole slew of trials, and there are 31 trials that we chose to include in our systematic review mm -hmm. and, is, and is referenced in the guidelines. Um, and there were over 12,000 patients that had been enrolled. So mm -hmm. the, the amount of data that existed was, had, had more than doubled. Mm -hmm. And that gave us a chance to refine and more precisely define you know, what we knew about transfusion and its impact on clinical events, and therefore come up with guidelines that we thought would be more reliable. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, so a, a lot, a lot more data, a lot more, uh, I'm uh, obviously I'm assuming, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, better structured studies rather than the observational studies of the past studies that, that you guys felt were, were, uh, were set up in a way to give you, to give you valuable information and valuable data. Well, that's right. But although, you know, we always, so one of the premises uh, and part of the reason why I introduced the concept of, of observational data versus clinical trials mm -hmm. in my preceding comments 
is that we made a decision. And to be honest, it was a real debate among the committee mm -hmm. members uh, in 2012. Um, it was a real debate that whether we should evaluate and include you know, observational studies in our systematic review mm -hmm. and allow that to influence what we might say. And I was able to um, convince my colleagues that that was not a good idea mm -hmm. and that we should only look at clinical trial data. Uh -huh. And so like back in 2012, we only looked at clinical trial data in our systematic review. And that was what informed uh, the guidelines. Okay. Okay. So I, in, in the article, and before we get to the recommendations, we're going to save that for, for just a little bit down the line. I think we, it's important to set up a little bit. In the article, you, you talked a little bit about some of the, the, the values and preferences and assumptions that, that you as a committee made uh, going into this, this study. Could you talk a little bit about that? Okay. So um, when, when you put guidelines together, you, you, have, you have to make some, some basic statements related to your preferences and values. And, and, and so what we have seen clinically, and I think the way the, the, the clinical world has responded, the way patients have responded, and the way the FDA has responded, is that we highly value avoiding even rare but potentially serious adverse effect, effects associated with transfusion. Mm -hmm. It's a really important, important point. The second is we value conserving blood so that if you're in a situation where you could either give blood or not give blood and, and it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of difference, then we're always going to weigh and recommend not giving blood to both avoid the side effects that I mentioned a moment ago, but also, also to save the precious resource of, of, of transfusion, of, sure. of red cell transfusions. Cause yeah. you know, it, it's, we don't have that much of the stuff and it costs a lot of money. Absolutely. So, you know, that, that's the, that was the, so when in doubt, we always would let these values drive our recommendations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, and you, you further made a comment that, that, that basically meant if, if you, if you ended up in a situation where the data suggested that you weren't hurting anyone by withholding, that would lead you towards a, a, a stronger recommendation for, for being restrictive with transfusion, right? Absolutely. That's okay. the entire, that's the entire point. So <clears throat> there are lots of situations where when you look at the evidence that there's not a whole lot of difference between the restrictive and the liberal transfusion mm -hmm. arms of a, of a study. Mm -hmm. Well, you would always then favor the restrictive group because it's less blood, it's less money, and it's less exposure to rare but definite side effects. Got it. That's correct. Okay. Um, so one, one of the things that I personally, as a, as a, pathologist blood banker have have always been concerned about um and and i i'm pretty sure that we that we share this concern is i have always been worried when guidelines come out that are that are numbers based that that we uh that people that look at them have a tendency to to lose the impact of the the clinical decisions that go into the, the clinical aspect of the decision to transfuse. Um, I, one of my very favorite things that I've ever seen you write was when you wrote an, an editorial in Transfusion in 2010. And uh, I, I don't know if this is original, so forgive me, I, but I, you said something about you wish that we had a, a quote, TMN blood test, the transfuse me now blood test, which just makes me really happy. But uh, your, your point kind of was that, that uh, the clinical stuff is important, but that people do have a tendency to use in that editorial. Your point was that they have a tendency to use the hemoglobin level alone. Um, so I guess my, that's my roundabout way of asking you. Uh, you and the committee obviously were concerned about this, and and you uh, and you made some statements about that. How do you feel about the the likelihood that people would take this article and use it as a hard and fast? Uh, the numbers that we'll talk about in just a moment, use it as a hard and fast cutoff and just use the hemoglobin level to decide whether or not to transfuse. Well, they will. <laughs> uh, you know, I, unfortunately, that's how doctors generally practice. And with transfusion is that they choose a number and that's the number they give blood um, to patients at. So if their threshold, you know, if their threshold's eight, if they're 7.9, they give them blood no matter how good the patient looks no matter what the rest of their status is. So we have in our guidelines, what we call a good practice statement, which says that 
um, that when you're, when you're deciding to transfuse an individual patient, it's good practice to consider not only the hemoglobin level, but the overall clinical context and alternative therapies in transfusion. So we're basically saying, look, you're, you're, and, and here's kind of the way that I think about this clinically and, and from a research perspective. The trials provide a, 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 a hemoglobin threshold because that's mm -hmm. how they're done. That's how they have to be done. That's a different conversation. But you can't do trials. Um, you, you, need to, you need to set up two arms of a trial that are different enough so you have a, a, the ability to, to find differences if they exist. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in which you create two groups that um, are, are, are distinct from one another. Um, so that inherently means that you're doing trials where you're comparing a 10 threshold to an 8 threshold, a 10 threshold to a 7 threshold. And so what comes out of those trials that says that, well, a seven threshold is okay or a seven threshold is not okay. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's the, those are the results that you get from that. But trials provide an average effect in a population of patients. Um, and, pay, you know, in some of those patients in these trials, some did better, some did worse. Mm -hmm. And um, so we don't, I don't, so from an average effect perspective, it's, it's a valuable number to base everything on. But we are doctors. We, right. want, we want our clinicians to be doctors. Mm -hmm. Patients are different. They're individuals. Yep. And when you, so the way I like to think about this is that you, that you take the clinical trial data and that gives you an average effect. And then you go apply that to an individual patient. And so some of those patients are going to be at a, thresh, at a hemoglobin level, let's just say, seven and a half. Mm -hmm. Some of those patients are going to look great. They're going to feel fine. They're going to be functioning well. They're not going to be tachycardic. They're not going to be hypotensive. They look just fine. Mm -hmm. And that patient, you would say, leave them alone. They don't need blood. Even though maybe the trials said, well, those patients would have gotten blood. Right. Whereas that same situation, a different patient could be tachycardic, could have a little bit of hypotension, could kind of look lousy, could be a little diaphoretic, could be a little short of breath, and that patient you would give blood to. So the basic point of our good practice statement is to say, these are the average thresholds, but you must look at the individual patient. You must see how they're doing. You must see how they're feeling. You must be doctors. Mm -hmm. And then use that information to refine how you choose to use blood. And that what we're providing are yes, they're hemoglobin thresholds, but but you should not use them in isolation. They have to be applied to individual patients. Excellent. Uh, well, well said. So, with, without making anybody wait anymore, again, I think most people are probably familiar with what uh, what you guys said in in your recommendations. So, uh, in this article, you made two two recommendations, one of which is related to the decision to transfuse red cells. The other one is related to the uh, the storage question. And just so you'll know, Jeff, I, I my most recent episode, the last episode of this podcast, I had Nancy Heddle on and we talked about Inform. So I don't think we need to go into the storage stuff. So let's focus on the, uh, on the red cell decision uh, recommendation. And would you mind taking us through what specifically you guys recommended? Sure. So um, I'm pleased to hear that you had Nancy on your your uh, your podcast, and she's the person to have uh, described the uh, the age of blood issue because mm -hmm. she's the real expert on this. Um, so, uh, and and those guidelines were sort of broken up into two sections, and she led the uh, the age of blood uh, portion of the guidelines, and I led the uh, uh, the red cell transfusion threshold guidelines Good. part of it. So anyway, so. We basically recommended that you use a restrictive transfusion approach in hospitalized hemodynamically stable adult patients. And um, this would include patients such as critical care patients. Um, and this was rather than a 10 gram threshold. Mm -hmm. And these were felt to be strong recommendations of moderate quality evidence. Now, um, we, we hedged our bet though. And um, our second recommendation was that for patients undergoing orthopedic surgery, cardiac surgery, and those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, we recommended a restrictive transfusion threshold of eight, not seven, eight okay. um, in, in those subgroups of patients. So let me explain why we are refining that. So we had a lot of internal debates. Is can we give one number for everyone? 
and and um, you know that's simpler, right? It, you know, we've we've already sure. talked that docs docs like one number. You mm -hmm. know, to have to remember two numbers, well, that's twice as challenging. And uh, <laughs> um, so uh, we followed a very important principle. That is, we followed the data. Okay, <laughs> we tried not to make it up. Imagine and that. <laughs> I, you know, I'm sorry to be so uh, uh, extreme about my views here, but. Um, <laughs> You know, most guidelines, I'm afraid, are making making things up. You know, they're they're extrapolating a lot of evidence mm -hmm. to settings which it hasn't been tested in. We provided two sets of God, uh, thresholds. One was an eight gram threshold, and the second was a seven seven gram threshold. And in the majority of the trials, a seven gram threshold was used, especially in critical critical care patients. But in other settings, such as orthopedic surgery, cardiac surgery, and those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, the trials used an eight gram threshold. Mm -hmm. And therefore, our perspective was that we should not be recommending a seven gram threshold unless we have evidence that it is in fact safe, because these are patients are different. And so for example, orthopedic surgery patients, one of the most important issues for them is their functional recovery. So while it may not be affecting mortality, patients may recover more rapidly, be able to take care of themselves, uh, get back to walking more quickly, get their function uh, back if their thresholds are higher. We don't know that's true. And we don't know that a seven gram threshold might not be absolutely the same. It could be. In fact, it wouldn't surprise, I would actually expect it might be, but, but we didn't have that evidence. We didn't have evidence that cardiac surgery patients may not have more MIs at lower thresholds. Um, they weren't dying more frequently in the, in the evidence that we had, but we didn't have evidence that there weren't more MI events. So we basically took the perspective that we needed direct trial evidence for the different thresholds we were recommending in the populations of interest. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have it, we did not extrapolate and assume that it would be okay. So that's why in the majority of patients, seven looked okay, but there were subgroups of patients in which we didn't have trial data and therefore, we advise an eight gram threshold. Got it. Got it. And and uh, tell us just for just for re reiteration purposes, specifically the groups that we, that uh, that you were using the eight threshold. So those were orthopedic surgery, mm -hmm. cardiac surgery, and those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease were the groups that we identified in in, in the guidelines. All right. Uh, so Jeff. Um, it, that uh, I, I think that's really helpful to to kind of give us a, a, a picture of of what you guys were shooting for and and where uh, how you were how were you were bringing the data in and I, I love what you said you you listened to the data you you took what you took what was there and uh, and and utilized it I think that's I think that's really really huge but I, one thing that that I noticed um, right around the t same time that these guidelines came out at least that's when I noticed it it may have been out before but I. I just a gargantuan article with you as lead author uh, from uh, from Cochrane Library that that discussed um, the uh, basically the trials, and I'm 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 wondering is was this was this those 31 trials that you were mentioning? Um, how how does the Cochrane article fit in with with the guideline article? Uh, yes, it was a monster paper, <laughs> and, and, and yes, it took a. Oh my goodness, it took a lot of time to do that thing. I bet. Um, uh, so, so the the when you do guidelines, you must always start with a systematic review of the literature. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, you you have to review what's out there because you have to you want to base what you say on the totality of the evidence. Right. And so the Cochrane Group is is you know internationally known as one of the premier locations. And, and, and organizations that perform systematic reviews of literature. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing this, I've been working with this group now for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. You know, initially I was part of the team that was doing the systematic reviews kind of as one of the content experts. And then the last couple times I became the lead person on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, before the 2012 guidelines, we did a, we we had updated that systematic review, 
uh, published in Cochrane as well as in JAMA that time. And then uh, this time we went back and updated and, and reviewed all those papers, the 12,000, you know, the 31 trials, you know, right. the 12,000 patients. We, and, and so they have a very rigorous process in which you, which you enter all this data into their software program and it rigorously evaluates it and uh, assesses the quality of it, the limitations and so forth. So, yes. So um, we, in parallel to, to doing the guidelines, mm -hmm. um, in, in parallel in doing the guidelines, um, we 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 had done the systematic review first. So I mm -hmm. had done all you know much of that work prior to our meeting, and was able to gotcha. present that to the to the organization. So they were published simultaneously. I think Jeff, one of the things that that people are interested in is is the way that you guys looked at the different subgroups um, that were addressed in in those trials, um, and uh, and looked at the risk, the relative risk of of uh, restrictive transfusion strategy versus liberal transfusion strategy on things like well, I'm obviously uh, overall thirty day mortality, but things like uh, myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, stroke, thromboembolism, things like that. Can you again? We can't we can't take that much time, but can you just kind of take us through that just briefly before we get to the big daddy at the end, which is the cardiac patients that are kind of a, a, a category of their own. But can you can you just kind of take us through the general aspects of what you found there? Yeah, sure. So this is actually summarized pretty clearly, I think, in the guidelines paper. There's some tables there mm -hmm. that summarizes it all. So we looked at a whole bunch of clinical outcomes that people are interested in. You know, that includes, as you said, acute MI, heart failure, infections is a big area mm -hmm. of great interest to the community, mm -hmm. um, and stroke and, and thromboembolism. And the long and short of it is we found no increased risk or uh, reduced risk with either threshold uh, in, in any of those outcomes. None of, none of them were significant. And, um, you know, as a consequence, we were able to say it, it not only didn't impact 30 day mortality, which was our primary outcome mm -hmm. in this analysis, but also any of the morbidity events as well. I, I would emphasize this, if, if you'd like, uh, the infection information, because Please. that's that's been an area of great interest to the community. Absolutely. Um, if one goes back um, only a year or so before um, uh, an investigator named Road had had performed a systematic review and summarized this and published the paper in JAMA. Um, I wrote an editorial mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that data suggested that there was an association between, you know, more blood, liberal transfusion and more infection rates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it looked, you know, reasonably secure. And, and that's what I said in my editorial. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out I'm wrong uh, <laughs> and uh, um, won't be the last time, I'm afraid. And uh, um, uh, because what happened was a couple big trials came out and they had a lot of infections in those trials and they were exactly the same in the two arms of the trial. And so what looked like there was an effect associated with liberal transfusion completely went away mm -hmm. and there was not a hint of, a, of an effect after you put these big trials in and that's you know that's the nature of the beast that yep. as as evidence accumulates answers may change sure um and i do wish i was a little more cautious in what i said in the editorial <laughs> but i didn't you know i'd like to <laughs> retrieve some of those sentences back but i um <laughs> Not allowed to do that. So, um, <laughs> um, but but in any case, um, the, it's really clear based on this evidence. There is no added, there's no additional risk of infection that we were able to observe. Now you can measure if you do in in, in uh, if you do animal experiments and other kinds of experiments, you can measure changes in immune function, mm -hmm. um, but it does not appear to be clinically important, and that is it's not leading to more infection. So. Uh, so, so it's a long answer to your question is we found no difference in any of the clinical events that we evaluated, uh, uh, no difference between the liberal and restrictive transfusion. So once again, in that case, there's no reason not to use a restrictive transfusion approach. Right, right, right. Based on based on the overall philosophy that you outlined earlier, absolutely. So, so let's so let's talk about uh, the, kind of the the elephant in the room a little bit, and that's uh, the the cardiac patients and the the. Uh, 
you you you've addressed them a little bit and uh in in that uh earlier you were talking about with card with cardiac surgery the the uh the eight threshold versus the seven threshold, but what about patients with with acute cardiac uh, situations, uh, acute coronary syndromes, and the like? And uh, I, going back to the study that you published a long time ago, as you mentioned earlier, that showed that the that when people when people have when people with cardiac histories have lower hemat, lower hemoglobins, they don't do as well. How do you reconcile all that? And what does the data show us there? Uh, and what do we do with all that? Okay, so this is an area that I still think we have a modest amount of uncertainty, and mm -hmm. uh, in some areas of it, we have no information. Um, so let me break um, this group up into two categories. Okay. This is the way I personally think about it. Um, I think about it as patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So these would be patients who might have coronary artery disease. They might have, be patients with heart failure, um, as an example, or they may be people who are as, who are especially at risk for those events. So, you know, renal failure patients, those with mm -hmm. uh, um, other, uh, they may have peripheral vascular disease, but no established coronary artery disease, for example. Um, that so that's one group with pre-existing disease, and then we have patients who come in with acute events, with acute myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome. Okay. I look at those as two different groups of patients. Okay. Um, and the trials have been done in, in uh, have looked at it mostly that way. Mm -hmm. So um, in the first group with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, um, the current evidence, and but this is being challenged a bit, even after I published some of this stuff, um, the current evidence seems to suggest that the lower threshold around eight is okay and safe. Although there, 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 is, there is a signal that there might be a higher event rate, a MI event rate in that group. Mm. Um, but I don't think it's, it's, we weren't able to demonstrate it in, in our work. And, um, uh, but there's other groups that have published some information since, since this was done that raises that as a possibility. But I, you know, we recommend in people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease that, that the lower eight gram threshold is still okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I would put that on everyone's uh, radar that you know, that story may, may be changing and we'll have to right. see how, how evidence emerges. Now, mm -hmm. in the acute coronary syndrome data, that's an area of great interest of mine. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we have just uh, embarked on uh, a large clinical trial that we call MINT, myocardial ischemia and transfusion, mm -hmm. um, in, in which we're going to compare basically a 10 gram threshold to a seven to eight gram threshold in acute MI patients. And this is funded by the NIH. And um, we're, we're, we're going to try to enroll 3,500 patients wow. um, all over the US and Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and to say the least, this is a uh, uh, big job. To try to <laughs> it sounds like it, yes. Yeah. So anyway, um, why, why, this, why this group? Well, um, there have now been um, 154 patients enrolled in two small pilot trials uh, of, in this exact group of patients. So we did, uh, also funded by the NIH, a pilot study of 110 patients with acute MI. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there's a second study of about 40 or so patients um, uh, 44 patients, I guess, to be fact, by Howard Cooper, Sunil Rao, um, in, uh, that was also in the same group of patients, uh, in the acute coronary syndrome patients. And what, if you look at mortality, 30-day mortality in that group, which I think um, few would argue is not an important event, mm -hmm. um, is that there were two deaths in one group and nine deaths in the other group. Okay, mm -hmm. two versus nine. Okay. And um, so you might ask, well, where are those two deaths? Well, those two deaths were in the liberal group and the nine deaths were in the restricted group. Okay, mm. So this is the first time we see anything, any sort of signal raising the possibility that, that a restrictive transfusion approach is not a good idea and right. that a liberal transfusion approach may be superior. Mm -hmm. Now, let me emphasize, this proves really very little. Okay. Mm -hmm. This this is a these, this is a small amount of data. Right. You only need a few patients to sort of move between the two arms for for what looks like a big effect to for it to completely go away. Mm -hmm. And and it is not it doesn't you should not change what you do. You should not base anything about how you take care of patients on this information. It's just not reliable. Got it. But it is the reason why we're embarking on this uh, 
uh, you know, large clinical trial. Right. And so, so we think that this is an area of uncertainty in our guidelines. We highlight this as a group that we make no recommendation, mm-hmm. i.e. we don't have data. We're not telling people what to do mm-hmm. when we don't have data. Okay. And, um, and therefore, uh, we should, you know, w- what we really need to do is try to get the data in large clinical trials, and that's what we're up to at this point. So in the acute MI patients, what I would tell people to do is, you know, you can go in with what your own personal biases are. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I generally will be doing lots of individual, individualization in those cases, and, you know, if they... You know, if they look a little funny, I'm going to give them blood, to be honest. <laughs> um, uh, but but I don't know if it's the right thing or not. And I think you should, you know, carefully evaluate each and every patient individually and, you know, make your best judgment as to when you should give blood in that setting. We just don't have evidence. Got it. The long and short of it. That makes sense. Okay. So, so back to the, so back to the recommendations as we, as we close out our, our time, Jeff, we've, we've got uh, a, a, basically a two, pro, a two parter uh, to use a restrictive red cell transfusion threshold of seven grams per deciliter in hospitalized hemodynamically stable adult patients, including critical care patients rather than 10. Um, and then the second part of that is that it, the carve out for patients undergoing orthopedic surgery, cardi- cardiac surgery, and those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease recommend a restrictive threshold of eight rather than seven. Um, one of the things that that you, that actually several caveats that you guys put in there, one of them you've already talked about, the acute coronary syndrome, but you guys mentioned a couple of other scenarios, and I wonder if you'd just talk about them briefly. Uh, the, the, patient, the hemonc patients with severe thrombocytopenia and the chronic transfusion-dependent anemia patients. You guys chose to kind of carve those out as well, and I wonder if you'd just say a few words about that. Yeah, sure. So the thrombocytopenic patients, so the, 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 the conceptual framework behind that is that um, there is experimental evidence that shows that patients who are, ane- who are anemic and thrombocytopenic are more likely to bleed than patients who are not anemic but are thrombocytopenia. That is, anemia plus thrombocytopenia seems to lead to more bleeding than, than th- isolated thrombocytopenia. So um, there were concerns by members of our group that uh, this, that using a restrictive transfusion may not be a good idea in this group and that we needed evidence and that some caution should be uh, made, uh, should be used in, in that group of patients. Got it. Uh, the second group of patients that we highlighted was, you know, more transfusion dependent people. So more patients with chronic forms of anemia that are getting transfused over a significant period of time. These are not necessarily acutely ill patients in the hospital in which your goals are short term to get them through their hospitalization, avoid acute complications. But the issues in this group of patients are are more uh, symptoms than functions. So Mm -hmm. that people who are chronically anemic, you know, they're fatigued, they feel lousy, they're unable to take care of themselves, to walk, to you know, to enjoy life, if you will. And, right. um, and so that it may be th- that the transfusion thresholds that you would use in that group would be different mm-hmm. than in the settings that we've been emphasizing up to this point. And therefore, what is needed, imagine I'm going to say this, what is needed is clinical trials in, in those <laughs> groups of patients um, uh, to really tell us what the right thing to do is for them. So we just simply don't know. Now, there are yeah. other groups of patients Acute neurologic disorders Mm -hmm. is an area of of interest for many that maybe the brain is especially sensitive to anemia. Mm -hmm. Um, There are there's not good trial data there um, uh, as an as another example of of places. So there there are certainly other subgroups that that we don't have. Uh, enough information, but these were the ones that we chose to highlight. So after you get through your three three thousand plus on mints, Jeff, you've got some more work to do. It sounds like. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I'm going to do this again, Joe. But 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 if if I survive Mint, uh, then we'll, you know we'll, we'll we can we can talk again on a podcast in five years, and uh, you can see if I'm crazy enough to want to do any more of this. There you but go. yes. Well, I have one last question for you, Jeff, before I let you go. And this will take just a little bit of setup. And I, I appreciate your, your, really appreciate your time. So I want to get really practical with this. I, I mentioned before that, that obviously you're a clinician and, and most, most blood bankers are more in the pathology realm. And, and, um, one of the things that I'm seeing in hospitals that I work with, uh, is, um, 
I don't I, I guess I would best describe it as more involvement by administrative people with uh, with quote unquote patient blood management programs and a more shall I dare I say a more militant look at trying to get uh, clinicians quote unquote in line with the guidelines and and I say that a little bit tongue in cheek but the, I I mean I work with hospitals where the the hospital itself will will literally from the ho- overall system have financial penalties if they don't have certain percentages of their transfusions falling within you know using the seven threshold for example um, I'm al- I always get nervous when hospital administrators get involved in in those scenarios and I feel like I'm feeling a little bit of pushback from clinicians. And and quite frankly, you've had pushback on, uh, you've had some darts thrown at you for, for some of your previous studies, like the Focus study. I saw some of the letters to the editor that people wrote after you guys published Focus, uh, saying that you were looking at the wrong things and you're not categori- categorizing anemia right and all that. So <clears throat> my bottom, I guess my bottom line question for you is this, how would you as a clinician advise those of us from the laboratory perspective who are, who are talking to clinicians about these guidelines, talking to clinicians about uh, appropriate transfusions? We, we constantly get the, you know, you're not a clinician, you don't see my patient. How, how would you advise us to have the conversations with clinicians that are productive so that we're, we're, we're both getting benefit from it and, most importantly, the patients are getting treated properly? Oh, Joe, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, so l- let me begin by um, – I'll make some, some, some generic comments. Please. Um, I think blood management programs are really – uh, terrific, mm-hmm. and I think I think guidelines can be terrific, and they can they can help our our clinicians take the latest evidence and apply them effectively to taking care of our patients, and that's what you hope they're going to do. And if they're evidence based, um, and there's good and there is evidence, mm-hmm. okay, because a lot of times so much of what we do there's not good evidence. Yep. Um, then I think it's reasonable to encourage clinicians to. To, to follow the evidence and therefore follow the guidelines. Um, so in, in our world of transfusion medicine, um, so we now have really pretty good evidence for, for red cell transfusion. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would caution you about some of the other areas that, that there may be a tendency to want to take on the, the perspective of telling doctors what to do. Right. That, for example, plasma therapy, we have almost no evidence mm-hmm. there. Agreed. Uh, for example, thrombocytopenia, except in the setting of hemonc patients, mm-hmm. we have no evidence there mm-hmm. um, uh, as, as two good examples. And so there, there's a tendency for um, some <laughs> to tell doctors what to do mm-hmm. based upon guidelines that don't have evidence. And, and I must tell you, I get my back up on that one. It annoys the hell out of me when <laughs> someone is telling me what to do when I know there's no evidence right. and they're acting like they know. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I think that when we have conversations with our colleagues, it needs to be firmly, it needs to be firmly set in, in, in situations where we have clear evidence about what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So I think the red cell transfusion world in many clinical settings, it does make sense to be questioning our colleagues if they're using blood at higher thresholds Mm -hmm. uh, in in, in many patients. Now, I also just a few minutes ago emphasized to you that clinical trials provide uh, in effect, in, in, uh, on average, but not in an individual patient, and that there will be, and there almost surely are, settings and situations where individual patients should be transfused outside of the routine guidelines. Right. And um, and so I think, and that's kind of what clinicians are saying to you. Mm-hmm. Now, they're, to be truthful, I think they're often using that as <laughs> an out. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you go to look at that case, it looks just like every other, you know, every other average case that was in the studies and, and that position's not defensible, Mm -hmm. but there clearly will be some that it is. So I think in the area of red cell transfusion, it is reasonable to be questioning people about, you know, if they're using liberal transfusion approaches Mm -hmm. and getting them to explain it and to be reviewing their cases individually Mm -hmm. and confirming that it makes sense um, to do or not. Um, 
But I, I get very nervous when it becomes a, a business decision. Oh, wow. um, That is because uh, red cell transfusions cost money. Yep. Hospitals are interested in this question. Exactly. Because they can save money. Okay. <laughs> yep. And, um, and, 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 and I don't want to suggest that they're not interested in the well-being of the patients. They are. Mm -hmm. um, but, but when administrators get involved with these kinds of decisions and make a big deal out of it and are investing in blood management programs, right, they're, 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 they're making a decision that's a combination of what's in the interest of the clinicians, but also what's interest in the interest of the financial status of the institution. So as long as it's being done for what's in the interest of the patients, I think it, it's just fine. So you guys who are running these programs, I think that your first job is to teach people about the evidence. Your second job is to collect the data and know exactly what people are doing. Mm -hmm. And your third job is to understand that there should be, there should be times when clinicians are not following the guidelines, but on most of the time they should, and you should be able to look at those cases and at least have uh, a clear sense who is always, I'll use the word, breaking the rules, <laughs> um, and who is doing it once in a while, and leave the people alone who are doing it once in a while, right. and the people are always breaking the rules, you need to look at those cases, and then there needs to be discussions about yep. that they're not practicing evidence-based medicine, and, and so I think there's a role for that, uh, for sure, mm -hmm. but it's more nuanced, okay? <laughs> it needs to be no more nuanced, and, um, and it's hard um, to do this well, and, and I do think that you know, if you're a pathologist and you're not involved in the, on the, you know, on the floors of taking care of these pa of patients like this, it's a harder role for you to play. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and you probably need, you know, those who are uh, frontline clinicians as partners with you to, to, to make the message more palatable to, uh, to your hospital colleagues. So that's a long answer to your question. I, I think it's actually pretty complicated. I think blood management programs have made a difference. Yep. The amount of blood that's being used, you know, in our country has fallen dramatically, appropriately so. Mm -hmm. I think this is all really good. Um, what we don't want to do is overdo it, and right. we want to be we want to be sensitive to the fact that individual patients may have different needs, and 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 we don't want to be rigid about any of this. I think that's very well said, and uh, I I really can't add anything to that, Jeff. That's I, I think that's a that's a great way for us to to close our time together. This has been a, a really really fun conversation for me. Thank you so much for for taking your your time again. I know you're a busy busy man, um, and I think this will really benefit some folks. So, Jeff, thank you very much for being my guest. You're welcome, Joe, and I wish you the best. And it's been my uh, honor to be on your program. Take care now. Thank you, sir. You too. Hi, it's Joe with a couple of closing thoughts. I want to thank once again my guest, Dr. Jeff Carson. I think he brought a very practical and real approach to those guidelines. Um, and I think one of the things that I hope you take from this is that as a clinician, what Dr. Carson said is really important, especially to those of us coming at this from a laboratory background. These are meant to be guidelines, and there still is room for clinical decision-making here. Um, it's just that, as he said, these will apply in the vast majority of situations, but please don't get into your head the idea that there is never an appropriate transfusion outside of these guidelines. That is simply not true. Much as you may hear that, especially when financial folks get involved in decision making. So no offense to the bean counters, but that's just the way I feel. Um, I hope that you'll go to bbguy.org um, and there's something there that I would really like to for you to do if you don't mind. Uh, please sign up there for the Blood Bank Guy newsletter. It's a great way to keep in touch and to hear the things that are coming in 2017. In particular, there's a lot of fun stuff happening in 2017 that I that you, you'll hear first through the newsletter. I'll never spam you, so so please check that out. One last thing, um, I mentioned that I'm recording this podcast in the beginning of of December of 2016. In fact, I recorded this podcast on December 2nd, 2016. That date may not mean a lot to you, uh, but to those of us who live in Southern California, in particular uh, to me and the folks that I work with at the blood bank where I work every day, it does mean a lot because on a day a year ago, December 2, 2015, 14 people were senselessly murdered at the Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino, California. 
So this day means something special to me. And quite honestly, on this day, my usual kind of flippant greeting to you to smile and have fun and all that doesn't feel quite right. So I just want to leave you with this. And, and it's just a very simple wish that I hope on your day and as you go through your life that love and happiness and friendship will reign and that you'll be okay in your heart. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. Take care and we'll see you last next week for one last episode of 2016. Take care. We'll see you later. Thank you.